Before we delve into examination of the foot itself, I think it's important to remember that a lot of parents come to clinics simply concerned about what direction their foot points in when their child takes a step. So the initial phase of any foot exam is simply to get an understanding of the child's foot progression angle. Now the foot progression angle is how the foot lies in a relationship to a line projected directly in front of the foot. And the angle can be affected not only by the foot itself, but rotational differences elsewhere. Rotational differences in the hip, rotational differences in the leg, rotational differences within the foot itself, and differences with regards to how the foot strikes the ground when it lands. So if we imagine a line projected directly in front of me, were my feet to be parallel to that line as I take steps, that would be a neutral foot progression angle. Now, if we imagine the same line and my feet were turned externally or away from that line, then that would be considered an external foot progression angle. Colloquially, this is sometimes called a duck walk by parents. Obviously, if the tips of the toes were turned towards that line, this would be an internal foot progression angle. Sometimes called pigeon toeing. Any of these foot progression angles can simply and usually are considered variations of normal. Children with flexible flat feet who roll their feet outward slightly will have a more external foot progression angle than children without flat feet. Many children who have residual tibial intorsion, which is simply a packaging problem from birth, will have pigeon toeing early in life that will resolve later in life. The fact that the foot progression angle might be perceived as different from what is considered normal by the parent is of less importance than identifying any pathologic process that might be responsible for it. So let's see how Taylor uh, progresses her feet as she steps and walk towards me slowly or at a normal pace. And as we watch Taylor walk, we see she's relatively neutral foot progression. Stop right there, Taylor. She does turn her feet ever so slightly to the outside so I'd consider to have a few degrees of an external foot progression angle. We can quantify this in more severe cases, stating that it's 45 degrees external, 10 degrees internal, just for documentation purposes. So in any child with a foot progression angle that seems to be a deviation from what you consider to be normal, it makes sense to understand if any component of that is coming from any of the parts of the extremity more proximal to the foot. So we typically start by assessing rotational profiles of the hip to see if there's any excessive internal or external rotation deformity that might be contributing to the way the foot rests against the ground as a child takes a step. In order to assess hip range of motion, we bring the hip flex to 90 degrees, the knee flex to 90 degrees, and we hold the extremity at neutral. We then internally rotate the hip, which will externally rotate the leg in relationship to the thigh, and we estimate what angle that internal rotation sits at. So in Taylor's case, she internally rotates about 45 degrees from neutral on this side. We can then externally rotate the hip, which brings the leg inward relative to the thigh to get an estimation of internal rotation. And she externally rotates maybe 45 to 50 degrees. This is very balanced internal and external rotation. We would check the other side and we would check the side simultaneously to make sure they were symmetric. But with such balanced hip motion, it's not surprising that she had a relatively neutral foot progression angle. We can also assess this in the prone position. We can also assess hip range of motion in the prone position by having the child lie flat on their belly, their hips are extended, and we bring their knees up 
to 90 degrees. We can then simultaneously assess internal rotation of the hips, engage the angle between the leg and the table. Here it's about 45 to 50 degrees, not terribly different than it was in the supine examination. It's easier to assess external rotation individually, one leg at a time. Here, Taylor externally rotates to about 45 to 50 degrees. And it's similar on the other side. So she's got very symmetric internal and external rotation of both hips, so it's not surprising she has essentially neutral foot progression angle during the stance phase of gait. So to assess any, any contribution of tibial rotation to the foot progression angle, we can do what's called the thigh foot angle assessment. And what I've done here is I've drawn a line directly down the axis of Taylor's foot. And then what we can do is imagine a line directly down the axis of Taylor's thigh. And we basically assess the angle between those two lines. If they are perfectly collinear, that would be zero. In this case, Taylor has somewhere between a three and five degree difference in those two lines. So she would be considered to have a foot thigh angle externally rotated of approximately five degrees. Now this is probably why we saw that slight external foot progression angle when she was walking. To assess tibial rotation in the supine position, we have the child lie on their back and we rotate their hip until their kneecap points straight up in the air. This will take any rotational differences of the hip out of the picture and, al and allow us to understand what's happening at the leg. In Taylor's situation, we then see that both feet are slightly externally rotated in relationship to the plane of the table. And again, find that she's got some tibial extorsion, which I'd estimate at somewhere around five degrees. Occasionally, a child with an internal foot progression angle will have a true foot deformity driving that. Uh, the most common of which would be metatarsus adductus. Now metatarsus adductus, there is an internal rotation of the foot itself. These feet are normal structurally on the inside, but they were molded into somewhat of an internally angulated position during intrauterine gestation. In order to assess metatarsus adductus, we simply draw or imagine a line straight up the axis of the heel. We then project that line distally, and we want to get an understanding of where the second toe lies in relationship to that line with the ankle in a neutral position. In this setting, Taylor's second toe pretty much is exactly in line with our heel axis line, indicating no internal rotation or external rotation of the foot. As the foot turns more inward, this line will then hit the third toe, the fourth toe, the fifth toe, or no toes at all, which is how we quantify the degree of metatarsis adductus that's present. To begin the foot exam itself, we simply assess the position of the foot in relationship to the tibia and the hips. In this situation with Taylor, her foot points straight ahead. This isn't significantly different than the foot progression angle we assess during gait, but it's very important to get an assessment of what the midfoot and forefoot are doing in relationship to the hind foot. Again, Taylor has normal foot anatomy, so all three components of the foot are well aligned. We need to also assess this posteriorly. So Taylor, if you'd turn around for us. And I want you to keep your feet perfectly parallel. Make them look like the number 11. Perfect. And so when we're examining children with flat feet, which is a very common foot disorder, be it rigid or flexible, or cavo varus feet, 
we're essentially studying the position of the heel in relationship to the Achilles tendon. So this is Taylor's Achilles tendon. And this is the center axis of her calcaneus. So in order to assess the position of the calcaneus or the heel bone in relationship to the Achilles, we either draw or visualize a line directly down the Achilles tendon. And then we visualize a line directly down the axis of the posterior tuberosity of the calcaneus. And we can do this on both sides relatively easily. Typically this is done without a pen, it's just done by visualization. And when we assess those lines, we note that they're relatively collinear perhaps the heel bone is ever so slightly turned to the outside, which we would consider an anatomic amount of hind foot valgus. In a severe plano valgus or flat foot deformity, the heel axis would be positioned very far externally in relationship to the Achilles. In a cable varus foot deformity, say in the setting of shark or Murray tooth disease, that calcaneal axis would be turned inward significantly in relationship to the axis of the Achilles. So moving along with visual inspection from the back of the foot, we can also get a sense of how turned out the midfoot is in relationship to the hind foot by assessing how many of her lateral digits, if any, we can see lateral to her heel bone. And to do this, we simply stand exactly behind the patient and we get a sense of whether or not we can see any of her toes external to the heel. In this situation, I can see her fifth toe and part of her fourth toe on both sides, which is considered normal. Once you start seeing the third toe and the fourth toe, that means that the midfoot is spun out. And this is something we typically see in a bad flat foot deformity. If you can't see the small toe, then the, then the foot is spun inward, and we can see this with metatarsus adductus, or again in our cable varus foot deformities that we see in children with peripheral neuropathies. Examination of the foot from behind can also be helpful in assessing flexibility, especially in the presence of a flat foot deformity. We can get a sense of subtalar motion by whether or not the angle between the axis of the posterior tuberosity of the calcaneus and the Achilles changes as the child goes from a standing flat position to standing up on their toes. In a child with a flexible flat foot, where that axis is angulated externally and they're putting weight on the medial border of their arch due to their flat foot, we'll see the arch reconstitute and we'll see that heel turn inward from a valgus position, which is external, to a neutral position, which is more or less where Taylor is now, and then ultimately even into a turned in position, which we call varus. So, we get an assessment of where the child's axis between the calcaneus and the posterior tuberosity of the calcaneus is in standing, and then we ask them to go way up on their toes. So Taylor, go way up on your toes. And we can see in her situation, the heels turn inward in relationship to the Achilles into a varus position, which indicates that she has flexibility between her talus bone, which is the ankle bone, and her heel bone, which is the calcaneus. That joint is called the subtalar joint, and that's the joint through which the heel either turns outward in a valgus deformity, like a flat foot, or inward, uh, such as in a cable varus deformity associated with peripheral neuropathy. One of the classic tests we use to assess subtalar motion which is really for children with a cable varus foot deformity is the Coleman block test. And this is designed to assess flexibility through the subtalar joint in a patient who has their heel turned inward and helps discern whether or not that turning in 
is due to inflexibility and a fixed deformity through the subtalar joint, or it's simply a result of the first ray striking the ground before the fifth ray and forcing the heel to angulate inward as a result of a very high arched foot. So in order to do this, we once again assess the angle between the Achilles tendon and the posterior tuberosity of the calcaneus. And then we ask the child to lift their foot up. We take a small block, in this case it's a two centimeter block, and we place it just under the lateral aspect of the forefoot. We then ask them to put all their weight down on the foot, which will drop their big toe, and we see what happens to the hind foot. In this situation, because Taylor does not have a varus deformity, we see that her heel turns into a more valgus position. Again, we know she has normal subtalar anatomy, but if that didn't change, it would be an indication that her subtalar joint was fairly rigid. We can also assess subtalar motion with the child in a seated position. Ideally, you'll assess it with the toe rise test as well as with manual range of motion of the joint. In order to do that, we're gonna bring the ankle joint up into maximal dorsiflexion. And what this does is it will lock the widest part of the ankle joint into the ankle mortise so it will prevent any inadvertent motion through the ankle joint itself and allow us to isolate the subtalar joint, which again is the joint between the heel bone and the ankle bone. So I want you to come up and stop trying to help me and just relax. I'll get it, I got it. Go down and go up. We lock it up and then what we can do is simply assess, we can grab the heel on either side, both medially and laterally, and rotate it inward and rotate it outward and you can see that her foot will turn in and her foot will turn out, indicating excellent motion through that joint. It's important when understanding and studying and examining the motion of the foot that the ankle joint really is just designed to go down and go up. It really has no side to side motion. Any side to side motion the motion that allows us to say navigate uneven terrain while hiking or playing soccer on grass comes through the subtalar joint. An inability to move that joint might be indicative of an abnormal bony connection, either between the heel bone and the ankle bone or between the heel bone and the navicular bone, which are termed tarsal coalitions. They will restrict subtalar motion and those children will present with a relatively fixed deformity without any ability to move through that joint. Typically that deformity is a flat foot deformity and we term that a rigid flat foot deformity. It's also important to assess vascular status. We can assess for the tibial artery pulse, which lies directly posterior to the medial malleolus. You've got a great pulse there. And then we can assess the dorsalis pedis pulse, which is just a few centimeters proximal to the first dorsal web space right here. The other thing we always look at, especially in children with foot deformities, is are there any calluses on the bottom of the foot? Calluses on the outside of the foot are frequently indicative of lateral column overload. They're putting too much weight on the outside of the foot and offloading their medial arch. We can see this in children with residual club foot deformities or cavivarous foot deformities. Children with flat foot deformities will typically have calluses on the medial border of their foot because that arch is being driven into the ground with every step. One of the most important parts of a foot and ankle exam is understanding tightness of either the Achilles tendon the gastrocnemius muscle, or the gastroxoleus complex. Now the Achilles tendon is derived from two muscle groups, the gastroc muscles, which sit high and give us a contour to the calf, and these actually insert above the knee. And because they insert above the knee, they relax if we bend the knee. And the soleus muscle, which originates below the knee joint and is the deeper of the two muscles contributing to the Achilles tendon.
in children with flat foot deformities and in idiopathic toe walkers and in children who walk on their toe for a variety of other reasons, we can often see tightness in one or both of those two muscle groups. In order to differentiate between tightness in the gastrocnemius or tightness in both the gastrocnemius and the, in the soleus, we perform what's called the silver skull test. And the silver skull test simply consists of assessing passive dorsiflexion of the ankle with the heel held in an internally rotated position. When the heel is in valgus, as in a child with a flat foot deformity, the distance between the insertion of the Achilles on the tip of the heel and the gastroc muscle is lessened, so we wanna bring that tendon out to maximal length by turning the heel in. Once we do that, we can grab the heel. I like to support the rest of the foot with my wrist and the lower part of my forearm. Keep the knee extended to keep the gastrocnemius muscle as tensioned as possible at the knee, and we assess passive ankle dorsiflexion. And then we document that as a difference between neutral, which is 90 degrees, 90 degrees to the leg, we call that zero or neutral dorsiflexion. And in this situation, I can dorsiflexor about 10 degrees beyond neutral with the knee extended. Now that is a baseline assessment. What we then do is we bend the knee to relax the gastroc muscles. We take them out of the picture. And now we see how much more we are able to dorsiflex the foot. So now that the gastrocs are relaxed, you can see that I can probably get her foot up into 20 degrees. Again, knee straight, 10 degrees, knee flexed, 20 degrees. So tightness in her gastrocs is contributing to about a 10 degree difference in motion, which is, is not unusual. The gastroc muscles are usually much tighter than the soleus. If there was no difference in the amount of passive dorsiflexion with her knee extended and the gastrocs on stretch and the knee flexed, then the tightness would be a result of combined issues with both the gastroc and the soleus complex. This helps us in surgical decision making, but it can help us clinically with regards to deciding how we're gonna stretch out children with tight heel cords. We'll now go over an assessment of ankle instability. Ankle instability is common in relatively older kids, especially those who have had multiple ankle sprains. In order to test for ankle instability, we first have to understand the ligamentous anatomy on the lateral side of the ankle and its deficiencies in the two major stabilizing ligaments on the lateral side of the ankle that are typically responsible for symptomatic ankle instability in adolescence. Now, those two ligaments are both attached to the lateral malleolus or the fibular bone. The more anterior of the two connects the fibula to the talus, which is the ankle bone and is known as the ATFL, the anterior talofibular ligament. The more posterior of those two connects the fibula to the heel bone, and that is known as the calcaneofibular ligament. Based on the anatomy, we can see that if I dorsiflex or pick Taylor's ankle up, I'm placing the calcaneofibular ligament on maximal stretch. If I plantar flex her ankle and pull it down, I'm placing the anterior talofibular ligament on maximal stretch. So in order to test for instability, we need to individually assess the function of both of these ligaments by what's called an anterior drawer test. An anterior drawer test simply involves cupping the heel and grabbing the ankle bone with your thumb and then supporting the tibia. Now, again, we wanna test the ligaments individually when on maximal stretch, to, so to assess integrity of the calcaneofibular ligament 
I'm going to grab the heel, grab the ankle bone, and I'm gonna bring the ankle into dorsiflexion or in an up position, and I'm gonna pull forward on the foot and the heel bone while pushing back on the tibia or leg bone to see if there is excessive anterior translation through the ankle joint. We then repeat that test, but with the ankle in maximal plantar flexion to maximally lengthen the ATFL, and again, assess for any excessive translation at the tibiotalar joint. Now typically, in children without connective tissue disorders, this, if they have ankle instability, will only be present on one side, typically due to multiple injuries and sprains. So we always compare the amount of translation from the bothersome ankle to the normal ankle to assess for any difference. Another examination performed with a child in a seating position are the examinations for both anterior and posterior ankle impingement. Now, anterior ankle impingement is typically a result of some dysmorphology of the ankle joint, typically the ankle bone itself, the talus. We see this frequently in children who have had prior intraarticular surgeries, particularly those with club feet. Their ankle, which is supposed to be a relatively rounded joint, becomes more flattened and can't roll under the tibia bone. Instead, it's flat, and as they try and walk over their foot, the front of the ankle bone bumps and bangs into the front of the tibia bone. So to assess for impingement, we of course first palpate the joint and see if there's any tenderness around the anterior aspect of the ankle joint. But more importantly, we perform forceful maximal dorsiflexion to see if that forceful abutment of the talus into the tibia reproduces any of their anterior ankle pain. And that's called the ankle impingement test or the anterior ankle impingement test. The same holds true posteriorly. Some children will have what's called an ostrigonum, which is a normal ossification behind the talus bone. A lot of folks have this, and the vast, vast majority are completely asymptomatic. Occasionally, it can be large enough, or the child can be active enough, particularly those who do gymnastics or dance most commonly, that that ossicle will bang against the back of the ankle during points of maximal plantar flexion. As you can imagine, uh, ballerinas and gymnasts spend a lot of time way up on their toes, and because they're maximally plantar flexing their ankle, they can force that ossicle into the posterior aspect of the joint, which can create pain. So again, we palpate in that area to see if it's tender, and then more importantly, we forcefully plantar flex the ankle to see if we can reproduce the pain they experience, and that's called the posterior ankle impingement test. Many children have overuse conditions nowadays that children are so engaged in, in athletic endeavors, more so than, than certainly I was when I was a child. So we're seeing a lot of tendinopathies, tendinitis, and even inflammation of the growth plates of the foot uh, in children, and we see this very frequently. It's a common cause of pain. The three most common locations we see overuse inflammatory type conditions are the Achilles tendon, which we've talked about a lot today. And this is very easy to examine for a tendonitis because it would be very tender as that tendon is palpated and their pain would frequently increase with forced dorsiflexion of the ankle. Oftentimes, children who have an Achilles tendonitis or the entity called Seaver's disease, which we'll discuss next, have very limited ankle dorsiflexion as determined by a silver skull test. And it's that restricted ability to bring their ankle up while they walk or run that places excessive stress across the posterior structures of the ankle, leading to micro tearing and ultimately inflammation and pain. Now to assess for Seaver's disease, we need to examine the growth plate on the back of the heel. This is called the calcaneal apophysis. In those who are nearing skeletal maturity, and certainly in adults, the Achilles fibers dive deep into the bone of the calcaneus. It's very securely anchored. But in younger kids, those around eight, nine, 10, 
that attachment of the Achilles tendon is connected to the rest of the foot by a very soft cartilaginous growth plate called the calcaneal apophysis. And that's the path of least resistance when children have restricted ankle dorsiflexion. And that's what tends to become inflamed rather than the Achilles tendon in that younger cohort of patients. So to assess for that, we simply slide our thumbs off the very back of the heel, maybe about a centimeter to a centimeter and a half forward, and we push and squeeze on both the inside and outside of the calcaneal tuberosity. And children with Seaver's disease will really jump and complain when we palpate in this area. Lastly, I'm gonna use this foot, we see plantar fasciitis in both adults, children, and adolescents. And this is typically characterized by pain on the plantar aspect of the foot. Oftentimes, it doesn't stop a child from doing the activities they, wanting, they want to do, but uh, becomes bothersome after they've stopped their activities and sat down or taken a car ride home or get out of bed first thing in the morning. In these children, the plantar fascia is oftentimes fairly tight. And like with the calcaneal apophysis or Achilles tendon, it tends to be overstretched during periods of prolonged or excessive activity. Micro tearing occurs, inflammation develops, and after sitting down, that inflammation results in some mild fibrosis, which upon resumption of weight bearing will cause immediate and sometimes severe pain as they walk. And this can be a chronic issue. So to assess for plantar fasciitis, again, we perform a silver skull test because this is directly linked to tightness of the gastroxoleus complex. And we then take the big toe and we dorsiflex it as much as possible. And this will put the plantar fascia on stretch because of some attachments to the flexor of the big toe. Oftentimes, just passively dorsiflexing or extending that big toe will be enough to set these children off if they have a fasciitis in this area. If not, it certainly allows us to really get a sense of how tight that plantar fascia is and directly palpate it to see if it's painful for the child.